okay, welcome. Um, this panel is being hosted by Cal Poly Humboldt Sponsored Programs Foundation. Um, SPF is the fiscal sponsor for um, Cal Poly Humboldt and manages all the outside grants and contracts um, uh, issued to faculty and administra administrators on behalf of the university. We're pleased to host this panel uh, discussion to bring awareness of the fellowship opportunity for students who are interested in pursuing graduate studies in STEM related fields. Um, today we'll be hearing from two students who have successfully applied to the Graduate Research Fellowship Program or GRFP, um, which is a program through the National Science Foundation, which supports grad students pursuing full-time research-based master's and doctoral degrees in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics or STEM um, or uh, STEM education. Um, Tara, if you could share um, the screen. I have a little infographic that I'll... Um... Yes, so um, it would, might be helpful to know that the geosciences in particular um, are good to apply in because they are uh, well-funded and have fewer applicants on average. Um, engineering is also very well-funded and there is additional funding set aside specifically for uh, applicants of underrepresented groups, including women, minorities, persons with disabilities, and veterans. The social sciences are less well-funded, but there are fewer applicants in that um, for that program. Um, however, the GRFP has also supported students in so psychology and sociology, both fields supported by the National Science Foundation. So if you're unsure whether your area of study would be applicable, please reach out to us. On this infographic, they have the eligible uh, major fields of study, but like it uh, says there, there are many of those fields have subfields. So if you're confused about any of this and want more insight, definitely reach out. Um, and in order to be eligible for this program, you must be enrolled in a graduate program by the end of the following academic year, or by the beginning, excuse me, of the following academic year. The fellowship program lasts for five years, including three years of financial support in the form of an annual stipend of $37,000. Um, the first step in applying to the GRFP should be to find a faculty member who is willing and able to support and mentor, your, mentor you throughout the process. You will want to confirm your intent to apply with your faculty member um, as soon as possible. And applications for the GRFP are due every February um, with the specific due dates depending on your field of study. So make sure you check the GRFP website to find the due date for your application, which I'll drop that link in the chat momentarily. Um, and you can also apply. So you're more than welcome to apply for the GRFP on your own with your faculty mentor. But SPF also has a consultant available to support students in completing their applications. The students who worked with the consultant last year had overwhelmingly positive things to say about the experience. So if you are interested in working with our consultant to complete the GRFP application process, keep your eye on the engagement hub, which I will also drop that link in the chat momentarily. Um, we'll have a separate application to support students who want to work with our consultant. Um, sometime in April, although the application for will be open throughout the summer, the deadline will be in early August before next semester starts. So it's a good idea to start talking to your faculty mentor and apply for a spot in the program sooner rather than later. Um, also in April, we will be hosting another discussion um, with the current program officers from National Science Foundation who will be able to provide more in-depth overview of the program requirements and will be able to answer any questions. Um, and with that, um, you can stop sharing your screen now, Kara. Um, and I will allow our panelists to introduce themselves, um, starting with Elizabeth. Thank you very much for hosting us, Ruby. So um, I go by Lizzie. I am a, a current graduate student in the wildlife department at Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, and I did my undergrad there as well, but, um, graduating back in 2016. Um, and sort of my journey um, is that I um, stayed in touch with a professor that I had worked with for an honors thesis as an undergrad and published with and um, 
I decided to pursue applying for the GRFP um, because of his volunteering for a research project um, with somebody I'd met through a professional organization called the Raptor Research Foundation. And they were um, doing this, uh, this particular research through their PhD and invited me out to help. Um, and so I had known about the GRFP since I was an undergrad. I'd also attended one of these, which was really nice. Thank you. Um, and I, um, in um, so I guess we don't have to go too much in depth, but I um, was um, exposed to this really awesome field work, had a blast, and it was pretty short notice at that point in the season. Um, I think I decided to apply in September and the deadline for at least the life sciences that I applied for was in October. And so it was a really, really fast turnaround. And um, I am immensely grateful for all of the people who helped me in the application process, including people in the sponsored program um, foundation, like Pia, uh, Pia Gabriel reviewed my application, Alex, who's on reviewed my application, and probably at least 25 other people, both like very casual friends and family, just to get more eyes on it, um, as well as um, people, all of my collaborators. And um, the writing studio is on campus and willing to help as well. And all of those people really, really honed in um, my application, which we'll go into it. It's a, it's a robust undertaking to prepare. Um, but just generally, as far as um, my area of research is continuing a long-term project on Swainson's hawks, which are a state-threatened bird. And um, it is now in its 44th year. So I'm very humbled to be part of that. And I do think that I had um, a lot of support um, in the particular project idea that I came up with. I felt really excited about and had a lot of um, people to weigh in about, you know, my perspective as a wildlife biologist was really wanting to find a project that had some sort of conservation value. And I think that was probably important in the, in the brainstorming of um, what research proposal you put together. But I also um, still continue my job, which is as an environmental consultant. And I had started that job shortly before I was um, awarded the GRFP and it's been the most phenomenal work experience. So I've been very fortunate to just work a few hours a week for them to continue that. And they've been, um, it's very kind of in um, tandem with the kind of work that I want to do through my research um, and as a professional generally. So um, I have just been very well supported and I really enjoy the aspects of how the GRFP has um, brought in my network in general. And I do think that that um, is one of the reasons that my application was successful is that I was really, um, really wanted to do a project that involved a lot of people. And for me personally, I'm very passionate about supporting others, particularly early career professionals and students. Um, and one of the ways I do that is serving on nonprofit boards. I'm on five currently, and I'm hosting workshops, which feels like almost every week, but usually a couple a month to try to share some of um, like skill-based things. And my project has a lot of room to take people out with me. So I brought three undergrads out with me last summer and I'm hiring a technician this summer and so on. So that's, that's a little bit <laughs> probably of a digression, but that's a little bit about me. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, Alex? Yeah, I also want to uh, just send some appreciation for the folks that organized this. I think that, um, well, first, let, let me begin by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Alex Dippus. I'm a botanist, and I currently work in the Indian Natural Resource Science Engineering Program, plus diversity in STEM here at Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, although uh, much of my experience with the GRFP came from my experience as a master's student here studying biology. I also did my undergraduate here at then uh, Humboldt State University in Botany. Uh, and my GRFP uh, fellowship also supported my, at least a significant portion of my PhD at Oregon State University. Um, the sort of focus of my research is the natural history of mosses um, and, and, and bryophytes more generally, uh, primarily focusing on the contributions that the fossil record can make to our understanding of their evolution, uh, ecology, and, and biogeography. Um, just echoing some of the things that uh, Lizzie has already mentioned, um, I, I think that the GRFP completely transformed my graduate school experience uh, and really 
fundamentally changed my trajectory as a scientist. I was a student that had been done really active undergraduate research in a lab here as an undergraduate student and really liked it, but I didn't have a bunch of exposure to graduate school. I didn't necessarily know, apart from my research mentor, you know, different ways that you could have your, your research funded. Um, getting the GRFP funding basically made it so I was able to fund ideas that otherwise uh, I don't think I would have been able to work on. Um, and I'm really appreciative for that. And just like Lizzie, a, a team of people, including people here at uh, now Cal Poly Humboldt and, and uh, sponsor programs and, and here in the academic departments were really instrumental in uh, allowing me to pull together a competitive application. Um, I, had, I was a GRFP fellow from uh, 2016 through, uh, I believe, 2021. Um, and it, it enabled me to fund uh, field work and, and research in Argentina, in Canada, in Wyoming, and really fundamentally altered my graduate school experience for the better. So I'm happy to be here and I promote it as something that undergraduate students and early career graduate students should think about. Um, one of the big challenges is it's a really significant um, amount of writing involved. And you do want to begin thinking about that relatively far in advance. I was fortunate enough to get put into it far enough that I, I think I had about a full year to get my application materials together. But as Lizzie has mentioned, you don't need necessarily all that time. But the, the more time you allow yourself to kind of have for revisions, the, the more time you can slowly and, and peacefully kind of work towards a competitive application. So I encourage any students that are currently on the meeting to really begin thinking about who their mentor might be and, and what potential uh, research projects they're, they're thinking about relatively soon. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, we can open up the floor for questions. Um, if you will, um, you can raise your hand using the reaction um, and I can call on you. Or if you're not comfortable um, with that in front of your mic on, um, you can uh, send a direct message to me um, in the chat or just post it in the chat. Well. Um, while you think of some questions, uh, I have some pre-prepared questions to ask. Um, so how has the fellowship, um, or we kind of already discussed that, but what is the most difficult part of the application um, that for you to fill out? Um, and what advice would you give to others that are filling out that part? You wanna go for it, Alex? Um, sure. Um, in my opinion, the whole thing is the hardest part. It, there's not, it's not really possible to tease out just one piece of it. Um, and that's really because it, it mirrors the structure of the NSF grants that professors actually put in by design to give students practice interacting with things that are very similar to um, what you will be you know, preparing if you do become a professional academic. Um, the, the NSF GRFP application itself consists of a personal statement, a research statement, and a, a relatively or very comprehensive uh, online form that, that sort of allows you in different ways, spaces to put in awards and scholarships and any kind of experiences you might have with some constraints. There are some things where you can only have a certain number of slots or spaces to articulate your experience. Um, I think for most people, if I had to choose, the, the writing portion would be the more challenging of, of those. But since both the research statement and the personal statement are, are so deeply intertwined, it's, it's really hard for me to say which one is harder. Um, collectively, they're, they're about five pages. My memory is a little bit blurry as to which one is two pages and which one is three pages. But one of them is two pages, one of them is three pages uh, in, in you know single space 12 point font. And you don't have a ton of space. And that really represents one of the greatest challenges overall. Um, you're presenting who you are as a person, who you want to be as a scientist. And what the project that you're passionate about is and why you are uniquely equipped and the team you're a part of and the institution you're a part of is uniquely equipped to answer that question. 
And you only have five pages to do all of that. And furthermore, you only have this relatively weird, very fixed, rigid online form to communicate any additional experiences outside of that. And so much of the exercise for myself was, how can I distill the project myself, the, the, the sort of aspects of my project that make it really compelling into the format and the space constraints? Um, and, and, and actually, broadly speaking, that's not that different from a, um, you know, a, a, a longer grant proposal that your professors would create and submit for a, a project. It, they are longer. The research statements are significantly longer, but they're still short um, given the, the scale of the project. So, you know, if my memory is correct, I think it's the research statement that's, that's two pages. Can you, do you remember it, Lizzie? It's, it's kind of a blur, um, but you don't have a ton of space, yet you have to outline the rationale for the project. You have to outline sort of why this question is uh, worthy of GRFP funding, what has changed or what is new that you bring um, that puts you in a unique position to answer it. And you also have to communicate broader impacts and that you also have the unique, you know, specific requirements like facilities requirements and mentorship requirements and mentoring requirements available to you with the mentors and at the institutions you're proposing to do the work. And that's a big tall order. Um, you really have to have a pretty well thought out research project as well as a well assembled team of people you plan to collaborate with. And so in many ways that in and of itself by figuring out who that team will be, what school you will do it at, and you know the the details of the research is super time consuming. Um, the The level of detail is high enough that someone who has general knowledge in your area can understand it and like think it's a good idea, but not incredibly detailed. So, like, I'll give you an example. Like, let's say you wanted to do um, geology field work. You would describe the specific reasons you want to do field work in this area, the specific layers of rocks, and broadly speaking, the general techniques you would use. You wouldn't, let's say, describe the specific reagents and the amount of time at each step, for example, in, in excruciating detail. You don't have space for that. And so it's, it's kind of a zoomed out perspective, and zoomed out has to be a good project. Um, but the details also have to be pretty compelling to someone that is an expert. And so it's it's a, it's a fairly unusual scale to be writing at, and that that's a major challenge. And you have to have a, a lot of legwork done to be able to write that effectively. Additionally, I, I think another challenge, you know, is you, you don't have to do it where you're currently a student. You can take the GRFP anywhere, and you also don't have to do the project that you get funded for. And in fact, much of my graduate work was not on the project that I wrote the proposal for. There is no requirement that the project you write the proposal for is, is what you then do. Uh, and that's because the GRFP is unique among funding opportunities like this, and it supports you as the student. And you can take it with you to any institution or almost any institution in the United States. And so it's not funding a project. It's not funding a project in a particular place. It's funding you and asking, do you have the capacity to come up with and write well, a, a basically a, a good research project that's compelling to a panel of experts in your field area. And that huge amount of space and freedom you're given can, can be a, a really major challenge to overcome. Um, you, you have so much freedom, it can be hard to narrow that down. But um, all that is to say, I think, the whole thing collectively is hard. It's hard to find a project. It's hard to figure out who your mentors would be because you have so much choice. But it's hard because you don't have much space to describe it after you spent all this time thinking about this awesome project and thinking about how you fit in as an excellent candidate for how to best understand that project. Um, and that's why I encourage students to really begin thinking and really kind of dreaming about it early. Because it, it can take some time to find a project that you're excited enough about 
to invest this time in. And it doesn't have to be a project that you actually can do, but it does have to be a project you can convince someone you could actually do. So that was a very long-winded answer to say the whole thing. Start early and, and think about it. Be careful. Yeah, that was a really awesome, comprehensive um, overview, Alex. I appreciate that. Um, uh, the only thing I would really add is uh, one of the challenges of the application is you do not get the opportunity to submit a resume. And so in the development of your personal statement, you kind of have to try to weave in the really critical things that have um, influenced your path and what makes you qualified. And um, it's it's kind of annoying because you know, it would be easier to build um, your resume as a beautiful showcase of your your um, qualifications. And then you also have to, you know, be more of a storyteller in your personal statement um, rather than like listing out <laughs> that I had this job and then I had this job and so on. Um, and, and so that that's really where I benefited a lot from uh, the feedback that I got when I was developing um, my, my writing. And um, let me think of what else. Um, I guess the you know Alex described this um, in your research proposal. You you were writing about a project that you have to you know convince them is feasible, but you can write it in such a way that financial um, constraints are not at play. So I wrote a proposal with the uh, inclusion of really fancy transmitter equipment that costs a lot of money, and I would love to do that research and you can get really valuable highly detailed data but i'm not actually doing that for for my research project because um it would require seeking you know tens of thousands of dollars more in research funding and um, i appreciate the guidance that i've received for my team is like let's make what funding you do have the most impactful and we don't have to i mean i um, I do think I've gotten a lot of value already from applying for the GRFP because I've been applying for a number of other grants, but um, even if I don't get them, I will be able to do data collection right now still. So um, it's all been a very valuable um, exercise spent in, you know, that very lengthy application process because it's applicable to, like in the ideal world, maybe somebody who wrote their research proposal actually ends up doing that exact thing, then, you know, they're already set up with tying that into their thesis proposal, their dissertation proposal, whatever track they're going down. Um, and for me, that was really helpful because I, although the specifics of the research question are different, I spent a lot of time trying to understand the system that I'm working in. And so um, I kind of had a little bit of a a leg up because and also I applied um but after I was out of my undergrad and um as I mentioned I was was volunteering for a research project but um I hadn't you know been per se like in actively a part of that research um and so it takes that takes a tremendous amount of time investment to familiarize yourself with all the work that's been done previously and i'm really grateful for that like jump starting um because now that's what that is what i'm doing as a graduate student is <laughs> making sure i understand what we're doing and what's important and what are the questions that haven't been answered yet um so no matter what like <laughs> even if you aren't awarded a grant application and, and this being one of the most phenomenal ones out there like I have applied to many, many things that I don't get, and there's always value to be gained from going through that process. Thank you. Um, there, okay, there are a couple questions in the chat. Um, so what would be a general timeline to apply? Um, I kind of mentioned this before. So the application, um, the deadlines all fall within October. Um, for the application. The dates vary depending on what your field of study is. Currently, the website has um, the dates from for the 2023 cycle. So just make sure you're checking in regularly for the 2024 cycle. Um, but as people who have applied, um, what when do you recommend starting um, on the application? If you have a project idea the earlier the better as alex said if you have advanced time 
um, especially because you're asking a lot of other people, no, ma no matter what, you know, with tying in your research team, as well as people who are going to provide you feedback. Um, and yeah, I mean, even just mentally thinking about different ideas. I mean, I was exposed to the GRFP as an undergrad, you know, five plus years before I applied. And every year as I was doing things, I was thinking about, is this the kind of project that I would like to do a GRFP like application for, you know? And, and there is um, more freedom in that scenario because you can apply, I believe the, the requirements may have changed, but you can apply multiple times if you are not actively enrolled in graduate school but you can only apply once, once you are already started a graduate program. Um, is that accurate, Alex? I think, I think that was still the case. In my understanding, that's still how it works. The rules have changed now twice since I applied. So my understanding may not be the most up-to-date. So with that scenario, like it, whoever's on the call, if you are an undergrad student um, and not actively enrolled in a graduate program, um, I uh, part of the reason that kind of gave me the confidence to apply, even at sh like a shorter notice in that, you know, sort of a month period was that, hey, like if I don't get it this year, I'll apply next year and just um, going for it. Um, and I mean, yeah, if you have an idea of talking to people, um, brainstorming, all of that takes a lot of time and a lot of bandwidth, and the more time, the better. Yeah, I, I really think that I agree with pretty much everything that would be said. Um, I think one, one good thing to do is to begin thinking, you know, about things that interest you and if there's anything that you bring or your team of potential mentors and you would bring that is unique that you know, that makes a really good opportunity to write something like this so in my case the the broad scale idea for what i wanted to do i had kind of bumping around in my head for the last several years and i thought this is something that i'm really interested in I didn't quite know exactly how we'd go about doing it, but I thought it was a good grant proposal idea. And then I ended up kind of eventually about starting maybe a year ahead of time, starting actually laying the groundwork, reaching out to collaborators, seeing if I could make that work. Um, for clarity, the, the specific project that I, I proposed in my GRFP was estimating the phylogeny of the earliest vascular plants. And that is something that had not been done uh, at that time for almost 20 years. And it still has not been done, apart from the work that I, I, I did on that question while I was a master's student. And basically, I was able to lay out an a idea where here's this really important question. There have been all these new fossils that have been published, there have been all these advancements that have been made in our understanding of how to make different kinds of morphological characters in a phylogenetic context. And no one had tried to apply them to this particular major question that remained unanswered and fundamental to our understanding of where all vascular plant diversity came from. And so it was a fairly broad, a very broad scale question, but I had very specific things that I thought I could apply and bring to that that no one else had thought to do yet. And this actually dovetails nicely into one of the questions that I can see in the chat where, where uh, Sarah Ashlock asked, uh, is it important to write the proposal for the scale, uh, to, to scale for the type of program you're interested in, a master's or a PhD? Um, and, and really looking back, the project I wrote was not appropriate for a master's at all. It was, it would have been an ambitious PhD. And that's part of why I ended up not fully doing that as my master's. But I still outlined it as if it was a master's. So the scope was really big, but I still outlined it as if it was a master's and that was adequate. Um, so you can you can dream big, kind of like Lizzie said, with maybe fancy equipment, cutting edge techniques, stuff like that. And it may it might not actually be implemental but you have to convince the NSF you have a plan for how you would implement it um, with the team and in the place that you have. So in, you know, in, in my particular case, that included, you know, 
finding collaborators who had expertise that didn't exist at this university and finding access to computational resources that the university did not have um, and putting that in the, in the proposal. They have to think that it's a well thought out and rationed proposal. Um, I really think that in terms of a timeline for, for how, to, how to do this, you can get some good ideas for how graduate programs, particularly PhD programs, approach it. In many elite programs, uh, which are overwhelmingly the programs that get the most RFPs, UC Berkeley, Stanford, University of Chicago, Ivy League universities, it is the default that your first year PhD students actually uh, write a GRFP proposal on their doctoral research. And they do that in part because you have all this wonderful background that you can take with you to kind of get started on your project as Liz already described with hers. But those programs have websites and you can, you know, there's lots of information that those programs have and recommendations that they have with regards to the GRFP. There's also a whole host of crowdsourced websites where if you, if you look around, you can see example um, timelines and also repositories with examples of other people's GRFP applications. And I really encourage anyone that's interested in applying to use uh, Google broadly and, and find this stuff because there are lots and lots of people who spend a lot of time writing and making good plans and timelines for how to do this um, that are fairly discipline specific. So, I mean, my, my world, which was the geoscience world, that may not apply and, and certainly would not apply to an engineer or a biomedical researcher, for example. But there are excellent resources that are out there online that you can find. Yeah, really quick, just to piggyback on what Alex said, that was a really good point. Um, I am was very, very fortunate to have access to a lot of my friends' applications. And so they were in a similar field to me um, within wildlife biology. And I could see the, you know, level of, um, yeah, like types of projects, types of writing approach, both for personal statements and um, the research plan. And I, I really benefited from that. I think it's it's just good to get your head in the mindset and see how people are really inspiring and how they um, tell their their story, their personal story, um, and think about how you want to want to frame your own. And then, yeah, thinking about just um, the especially the pieces of um, your the how you write a re the research proposal for that uh, the GRFP application where you know the um, how you're the best person to do that research and how it has broader impacts. Um, I, th I think that, that was really helpful for me personally. I um, also want, uh, just with the timeline, um, the first thing you should do, and if you're even thinking about applying, definitely start talking to faculty members that you are interested in having as a mentor. Um, it's like I mentioned before, it's really important for you to have that faculty. Um, on board with your application um, and project ideas. Um, and also, um, I'm going to leave the floor for Erica to talk a little bit about the consultant um, that we have available. Yeah, I just um, nudged Ruby to remind you, she did mention it briefly in our introduction, but um, last fall, we hired a consultant to work with 10 students on their GRFP proposals, and they work with students across the CSU system, and they've been doing it for quite a long time. And um, the students who completed that said overwhelmingly that it was very, very valuable, very useful. They have modules, and they worked with um, students one-on-one -on, -one on their statements, and they have examples to, um, for you as well, and they help work with your faculty mentor. Um, and so that we want to offer that again this year as well. And so um, we are going to open up a, like a, a, a through our engagement hub that Ruby mentioned, we're gonna open up a application process to work with the consultant. And I think this is another reason why I'm remembering that timeline is crucial because, because it's, um, because summer is coming, right? And then the faculty will be less accessible and we have to have a list of students that will work with the consultant by August 15th, which is before the semester starts. So that's, that's the, that's, uh, if you do want to, of course you don't have to work with a consultant, but it's free for you. Our office pays for it. Um, and so if you wanted to go that route and wanted that support, we just, we're trying to like make sure everyone's aware of it 
early in this semester so they can talk to their mentor and we'll have that application open sometime in April. We're still figuring out what we what we need to collect from you, but just to just wanted to put that out there again. Thank you, Erica. Um, I also uh, posted the links to the application and the engagement hub in the chat. Um, and uh, Alex also posted some helpful links um, for useful resources that he had found for the GRFP. Um, I wanna circle back to another question that was left in the chat. Um, would grad school have been feasible for you to fund without the GRFP? Uh, yeah, we're both ready to talk. <laughs> you can go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, I really appreciate that question. And um, hands down, I wouldn't, uh, I would not be pursuing a graduate degree without this funding. And um, a little bit more about my background. I was the first person in my family to go to undergraduate college to begin with. And um, I am really, really grateful I had that. Um, support. I mean, to, it, I got so much out of going to uh, Humboldt State. And yet I still ended up with student debt. Um, my family is very poor. I'm one of eight children. Um, and like, as I've become a professional, I'm doing little things that I can to still actively financially support my family with little things like I pay multiple families phone bills. It's, it's something I can do. Um, but uh, I have been very fortunate to feel fulfilled in the jobs that I have had um, since gra graduating from my undergrad. And um, I didn't feel like it was entirely necessary for me in the career path that I was following to do a graduate degree. And yet I have been exposed to some really fulfilling research, research um, projects, including I had a research experience for undergraduates, which is another um, NSF funded opportunity. And for for undergraduate students, as it as it says in the name, um, and so I always like very very much wanted to do a graduate project. Um, yeah, how are you? Do rock, <laughs> Alex. Um, but it um, I I've seen in my peer group um, a number of people pay for all of their research funding um, and really take on a lot of credit card debt and really struggle. And so I personally was very picky about only wanting to do a graduate project if it had funding and if it was going to provide me with the mentorship that I particularly wanted and the, the skills that I wanted to gain um, and that I was offering my energy towards something I really care about. And so, as I mentioned, I was volunteering on that research project with um, a friend. And I totally fell in love with the study area, the study species. The whole team was so um, passionate about the work that they're doing and very, um, very inclusive. That was really important to me as a woman in STEM who has faced some misogyny in some of the work that I've done. And um, although I'm working with all male collaborators, they, um, they I think they're well aware and like very, um, just very supportive and um, in in a number of ways and already now as doing work with them I like have had so many little moments of reassurance about wow these people are amazing and they're offering so much of their um, expertise to support me in different ways so that was nice too um, and I encourage you like all as undergrads you know to kind of develop relationships however you can with getting exposed to people who are doing kind of the, the kind of research you might be interested in and seeing how they interact. Um, because I, I w because I've seen people have some really negative like personal relationships with their advisors, I wanted to make sure I knew who I was going to be collaborating with because I'm going to be, you know, in the depths of this for, <laughs> I'm, 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 this is my first year, I plan to be doing this for probably another two. Um, and it's a lot of time and energy. Um, so um, I'm very, very grateful and I want to help like propel other people's careers as a result because I certainly would not be getting a graduate degree without this funding just given my financial background. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for um, sharing all of that. I think, this is a really interesting question. And, and I think 
one of the key missions of the GRFD is to make graduate research accessible to, to folks for whom it otherwise would not be. In my case, I had already decided to pursue a master's degree before I got GRFD funding, but I was really having a hard time um, basically figuring out how, how I was going to support myself through that process. It's very likely I would have been able to kind of live through my, my master's with the very limited support that I had at my disposal without the GRFD, but I certainly would not have gone to pursue my PhD without the GRFD. It funded one third of my PhD and was essential to that. Um, in addition to opening up doors to me that would have otherwise remained closed without having this reward. And, and one of the benefits of the GRFD is it isn't just you know a chunk of funding. It's also something that is recognized by scientists worldwide as a major accomplishment. Um, and it, it absolutely helps you obtain additional funding. So I, I think I probably would have prob continued with my master's. I, I find it very unlikely that I would have obtained my PhD without the GRFD in a myriad of ways. It, it also fundamentally changed what I would have probably done and, and the sorts of, of research that I, I ended up choosing. I ended up choosing a very niche specialty that was something that was very passionate to me that there really is not a historic record of people doing this. I really ended up focusing on the, the fossil record of bryophytes, um, which is something that I was very interested in. Uh, bryophytes are tiny plants. They sort of conventional narrative is they don't fossilize. And um, the, the sort of conventional wisdom was everybody knows they don't preserve well. And that's why there's not much of a fossil record. And having the latitude of GRFD funding allowed me to actually pursue this really specialty um, research question in both my master's and my PhD that otherwise I don't think would have been fundable. In many ways, that particular question is not attractive to funding agencies. Um, but because I had this really flexible um, funding that I could take with me and use for different projects, I was able to explore this otherwise, you know, probably not fundable project. And in the process, discover that pretty much our, our, our entire conventional approach to the bryophyte fossil records incorrect. They preserve beautifully in incredible detail and they're quite abundant, but we've overlooked them because we've never, no one has ever really carefully looked um, for them. And so, um, well, I, I probably would have at least gotten a master's degree without the GRFP. I, I would have been really tied to another researcher's interests and basically had to glom on to an already funded project uh, for my master's and, and probably for my PhD if I would have even done one. But instead, I had the freedom to come up with my own ideas and pursue them freely. And that's something that is very rare for a graduate student to have the opportunity to do. And it really equips you very well for a, a wide range of careers in science because you end up having to identify what's where's the need or what's interesting and come up with your own ways of how to answer that question. So I think I probably would have had my master's, probably not my PhD, but it, it put me sort of in control of my graduate uh, school experience in a way that I don't think anything else could have. Thank you for sharing as well. Um, so uh, I have another pre-prepared question. Um, what, um, what do you wish you'd known before applying to the GRFP? The, the biggest thing that I, I think I, I, I wish that I would have known about having the, the, the GRFP was being aware of um, the fact that you have tax liability for that. Um, so it's not like, like income from a job where, where taxes are taken out ahead of time. Um, you do have to pay taxes on that income and it's not taken out ahead of time. And because I had the GRFP at a couple different schools, 
uh, the schools generated the paperwork for that in totally different ways that resulted in very different um, taxes being due. So when I took my GRP with me from Humboldt State to Oregon State, the amount that I was expected to pay taxes for was totally different. And that took me completely by surprise. It resulted in about an additional $6,000 of tax liability. One year I was not expecting to have. Unfortunately, I was able to figure that out, but that was not something that was on my radar at all and kind of came out of nowhere. Um, but in terms of applying to the GRFP, I, I feel like the, the thing that I wish I knew before I got pretty far into the process were the excellent online resources. And that's why I shared those two links above, in particular, that first one, alexhunterlang.com has a really excellent analysis of what goes in an effective proposal. And I believe it has the largest repository of proposals. So you can actually look at a bunch of proposals, either all funded, or there might be a combination of some that are funded and some aren't, and it tells you whether or not they were successful. That's an incredible resource that I wish I had known before I got like halfway through writing my own uh, proposals. Yeah, I don't know if I have much to add. Um, I, I do think familiarizing yourself with the application as soon as possible and, and those prompts and brainstorming that just took me so long <laughs> to, to frame up how I wanted to respond. So it, it, it will help and, um, and just getting, you know, pen to paper of different things and not feeling um, particularly, you know, obligated to, if, if you change your mind, I think uh, about like, it, I mean, depending on how much time um, you have in your application process, uh, how I have done better with writing is to get something on there. And if I don't like it, you know, it's okay to scrap it, but it, it just, it, uh, the writing process will take a lot of effort and um, it, uh, yeah, thinking about your strengths and your um, passions and what you have to offer, all of that, you know, as early as possible will benefit you. I have one more, one more idea. I, I didn't mention that, that Lizzie already touched on briefly. I, I want to expand on just a little bit. And that's that the NSF proposal you exactly how you're going to be evaluated ahead of time. Make sure to familiarize yourself with that. They lay out specific criteria. And there's two broad categories of criteria. There's intellectual merit, and that's like the academics, the science. Is this well thought out? Is this feasible? Um, is this the right kind of institution to do this research? Are this the right kind of collaborators? That sort of questions. There's also broader impacts, and broader impacts is in a general sense, as well as a specific sense. Is there anything in your proposal that is maybe not directly related to the research, but that you want to do that, for example, promotes um, you know, people from historically marginalized communities to be involved or boosted up by your work? Do you want to do community or public outreach? Um, virtually every proposal for the GRFP is going to have outstanding intellectual merit. A far fewer number will both have outstanding intellectual merit and outstanding broader impacts, including both broad scale broader impacts and very specific detailed plans at a fine scale. And, and from my experience helping a number of applicants prepare materials and my own experience preparing them, it's harder to get good advice about how to, how to write the, the, uh, the, the broader impacts. So it might take a little more time to think about that part of it, but it's just as important because that's the weak point of most applications. So if you can really get amazing broader impacts, both in the general sense, like in my project, the, the general broader impact is this is a big scale question. Um, but I also had very specific public and community outreach elements of my project that in particular were designed to work with Native American and particular tribal communities. So being creative and thinking about what kinds of good you can do while you're doing your project, it's maybe not explicitly related to it, but that does dovetail nicely with the project and where you want to do the project and with what collaborators you want to do the project. It's really important because most proposals will not have that um, in a way that's very well thought out. It'll kind of be an afterthought. And so if you make that not the case, not only do you get to do that good, you also get to have a significantly better score when the reviewers are evaluating your application in a way that most others can't. 
And you have to have outstanding scores in both those categories to be in the running for really receiving the DRFP. Thank you. I think that's really good um, advice for that section. Um, are, uh, do you have any additional advice um, for students that are interested in applying that you haven't um, touched on already? Yeah, I can go. Um, just speaking more broadly to um, thinking about your graduate school opportunities. Um, for me, what was most impactful is being involved in professional societies and going to scientific conferences and getting exposed to people who are doing the kind of research that interested me. So like I mentioned, I met this friend through a scientific conference now seven years ago and um, volunteered with him. And that's how, because of like years of getting to know him, he invited me out um, to help him on his research product and so on. But I have also in, um, I have applied to other graduate projects that in all of which I, you know, met a professor at a conference, I met a grad student at a conference that was doing something that piqued my interest. Um, and especially, you know, depending on where all of you are at in your academic careers, like, um, if you, if you don't necessarily think you want to continue at Humboldt, you know, there's so many other schools out there and it's really hard, like it's almost feels <laughs> impossible to know how to find the right person that you would be interested in collaborating with and finding a good mentor and all of that. So I do think, um, yeah, being really explicit with people about what your interests are, um, because uh, there's like one of my very close friends who is um, a species expert on salt marsh harvest mice and they're only found in the San Francisco Bay. And her first job out of college was doing fisheries work. And it's a job and it was a great job. She enjoyed it, but she told her boss, she said, no, I'm really passionate about rodents. I really want to study rodents. Um, and he introduced her to, um, you know, just by chance, this leading expert of salt marsh harvest mice. And that person went on to get a master's <laughs> in that species and then a PhD. And she is one of the leading experts on that species now. Um, and so I think that's a beautiful story because she, you know, she knew that she wanted to study small rodents. And even though she was doing a fisheries job that, you know, you might feel um, uncomfortable being candid about having such a different interest than like, you know, the job you have at hand. And um, yet, if you're more explicit about what your interests are, you're more likely to have people help you make those connections. So, um, yeah, I think that helps. I really appreciated you, you talking about um, conferences and making connections, because I think that's a huge important thing that in general undergraduate students have at their disposal that, that's underused, particularly at Humboldt, because we're not you know near any other universities and we, we oftentimes don't have big conferences happening on campus. But being able to make connections within your area of interest is super important and that in a way, is kind of step one in this because you're that that puts you in contact with other people that have been able to build careers in the area you're interested in, and see what kind of questions they've been able to make careers out of, what kinds of of, of, of like, you know, approaches do they use, and that stuff kind of stewing around in your brain is the first step in, in coming up with a good proposal. In addition, you also have a network of people that you can you know begin to think about who might be a good potential mentor. And it really opens your um, possibilities up. There are many excellent mentors and professors here at Humboldt, but there's many more that are not here. And one of the easiest ways to get access to them is through conferences, professional societies, and any other case where you're, you're getting um, interactions with professionals. So like uh, courses that are put on by professional societies are a thing that comes to mind. There's a whole con whole host of things you can do to just get around other people in your area of interest. And that's in many ways like the first step. And it also gives you a community that can help you when it comes time to, to drafting this, if, if, if you, you know, are able to get your ideas to that stage. Thank you. Um, so there are four minutes left um, of this session. Are there any uh, questions from the audience? Um, 
So how personal is the personal statement? Is it better to focus on your strengths as a researcher or your social background? I think we'll just have one panelist answer this so we can wrap it up. Okay, I'll try to be quick. Maybe Alex can jump in. Um, but I think that the categories of both intellectual merit and broader impacts apply to both your research plan as well as your personal statement. And so thinking about um, your skill set that do make you qualified to be a great person to do the project is really important. So what experiences um, have like really um, set you up for success? How, how um, what do you bring to the table? And um, how have you demonstrated that tangibly in your prior experiences? Um, in, I do think it's really important to set, to tell a story and um, be like genuine because um, that's the trick as a scientist that hasn't really been trained to perfect my writing skills in that way <laughs> um, as much as like doing, you know, here's this X, Y, Z, the facts, et cetera. Um, but I, um, I did tell more of a, a, a social story and I have, um, had a lot of adversity um, through some of my family situations. Um, like I said, I grew up poor, my parents were divorced, there's a lot of um, trickiness, I moved out really young. And yet, my, like my story, what I really wanted to come down on, uh, express in my, in my personal statement was that throughout all of it, what made a difference for me was um, a community and from like a very early age I had uh, a group of people that I found inspiring and supportive and then I felt motivated to interact with and give back to and that is sort of like my mission in life and so I wanted to be really clear about like th that was what I drilled into and how I um, I came to that like knowing I wanted to express that in my personal statement and then getting some guidance about how do I do that and you know how do you pull it all together with being a scientist and a person who's faced adversity and where do I want to go professionally you, you, it is a trick because there's a lot to fit into a short amount of space but I do think that's the real beauty of this um, application in particular is you do get to share yourself individually and they are also recognizing and awarding this to you as an individual. Um, thank you. Uh, we want to give a big round of applause um, or virtual applause um, and appreciation to our panelists for their very insightful um, comments and advice. Um, and so thank you um, to our speakers and thank you all for joining us today in the audience. We hope to see you back um, here in April for the next talk with the guests from the National Science Foundation. Um, thank you and have a great weekend. Bye, everyone.